St. Mary's Church in Berkeley is a striking 13th century church standing beside Berkeley Castle. The church is notable for its medieval wall paintings, detached tower, table tombs, and memorials to the Berkeley family. There has been a church here as early as the Saxon period, but the present St. Mary's dates primarily to the 13th and 14th centuries. The sheer size of the church is striking, situated in such a small village. More unusual is the detached tower, a feature more commonly found on the European continent but rarely in England. The tower is 17th century, and stands on the site of an earlier church. Although it stands in a peaceful wooded glade beside the entry to Berkeley Castle, St. Mary's has not always been a peaceful place. During the English Civil War, the Royalist forces defending Berkeley Castle used the church as an outer defensive perimeter for their defense of the castle. The marks of bullets fired by the attacking parliamentary forces can be seen in the west door. The defenders of the church were eventually overcome, and the parliamentary army raised cannon to the church roof, overlooking the castle, and the castle was forced to surrender. A special feature of St. Mary's is the sheer number of table tombs in the churchyard. The most famous of these tombs is the early 18th century memorial to Dickie Pierce, family jester to the Earl of Suffolk. Pierce, probably the last court jester in England, died at Berkeley Castle and was buried in the churchyard. Pierce is supposed to have died after falling from the minstrel gallery during a performance, though an alternative version is that he was murdered. The verse inscribed on the tomb is thought to be the work of the author Jonathan Swift. St. Mary's features a wonderful collection of medieval wall paintings, including a doom painting above the rude screen. The paintings lay for centuries under layers of whitewash and were only discovered by accident during cleaning in the Victorian period. In addition to the paintings, the interior is notable for the memorials to the Barclays of Berkeley Castle. The tomb of Thomas Barclay, the fifth baron, and his wife Catherine, is worth mentioning for the excellent carving detail. This tomb is found on the north side of the nave. The oldest parts of St. Mary's are the south door and the font, both of which date to the Norman period. The Great East Window contains a stained glass memorial to one of the village's favorite sons, Edward Jenner, who discovered the smallpox vaccine. Jenner's stone memorial is beside the altar, and to the other side is the Barclay Chapel, which contains a wonderful collection of medieval memorials to the Barclay family. Dr. Jenner's home of the Chantry stands immediately beside the churchyard and is now a museum to his life and work. Jenner was born on the 17th of May 1749. He was the born to the vicar of Berkeley, the Reverend Stephen Jenner. Jenner went to school in Wooten Underedge and Sirencester. During this time he was inoculated for smallpox, which had a lifelong effect upon his general health. At the age of 14 he was apprenticed for seven years to Mr. Daniel Ludlow, a surgeon of Chipping Sodbury. In 1770 he moved to St. George's Hospital in London, to complete his medical training under the great surgeon and experimentalist John Hunter. Hunter quickly recognized Edward's abilities at dissection and investigation, as well as his understanding of plant and animal anatomy. In 1772 at the age of 23, Edward Jenner returned to Berkeley and established himself as the local practitioner and surgeon. Jenner remained essentially a resident of Berkeley for the rest of his life. Like any other doctor of the time, Edward Jenner carried out variolation to protect his patients from smallpox. However, from the early days of his career Edward Jenner had been intrigued by country law which said that people who caught cowpox from their cows could not catch smallpox. This and his own experience of variolation as a boy and the risks that accompanied it led him to undertake the most important research of his life. Cowpox is a mild viral infection of cows. It causes a few weeping spots, pox, on their udders, but little discomfort. Milkmaids occasionally caught cowpox from the cows. Although they felt rather off-color for a few days and developed a small number of pox, usually on the hand, the disease did not trouble them. In May 1796 a dairymaid consulted Jenna about a rash on her hand. He diagnosed cowpox rather than smallpox and she confirmed that one of her cows had recently had cowpox. 
Edward Jenner realized that this was his opportunity to test the protective properties of cowpox by giving it to someone who had not yet suffered smallpox. He chose James Phipps, the eight-year-old son of his gardener. On the 14th of May he made a few scratches on one of James' arms and rubbed into them some material from one of the pox on Sarah's hand. A few days later James became mildly ill with cowpox but was well again a week later. So Jenna knew that cowpox could pass from person to person as well as from cow to person. The next step was to test whether the cowpox would now protect James from smallpox. On the 1st of July Jenna variolated the boy. As Jenna anticipated, and undoubtedly to his great relief, James did not develop smallpox, either on this occasion or on the many subsequent ones when his immunity was tested again. Jenna followed up this experiment with many others. In 1798 he published all his research into smallpox in a book entitled, An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Varioli Vaccine, a disease discovered in some of the western counties of England, particularly Gloucestershire, and known by the name of the cowpox. In each of the next two years he published the results of further experiments, which confirmed his original theory that cowpox did indeed protect against smallpox. Jenner's newly proven technique for protecting people from smallpox did not catch on as he anticipated. One reason was a practical one. Cowpox did not occur widely and doctors who wanted to test the new process had to obtain cowpox matter from Edward Jenner. In an age when infection was not understood, cowpox samples often became contaminated with smallpox itself because those handling it worked in smallpox hospitals or carried out variolation. This led to claims that cowpox was no safer than smallpox inoculation. There were also many surgeons who did not want Jenna to succeed. They were the variolators whose large incomes were threatened by Jenna's safer and more effective cowpox treatment. People quickly became fearful of the possible consequences of receiving material originating from cows and opposed vaccination on religious grounds, saying that they would not be treated with substances originating from God's lowlier creatures. Variolation was forbidden by Act of Parliament in 1840 and vaccination with cowpox was made compulsory in 1853. This in its turn led to protest marches and vehement opposition from those who demanded freedom of choice. Edward Jenner spent much of the rest of his life supplying cowpox material to others around the world and discussing related scientific matters. He was so involved in corresponding about smallpox that he called himself the vaccine clerk to the world. He quickly developed techniques for taking matter from human cowpox pox and drying it onto threads or glass so that it could be widely transported. Barclay Castle's main claim to fame rests on its role as the final prison of King Edward II. It was here, in a small, squalid room just off the main entrance to the castle, that the unfortunate Edward was cruelly murdered by his captors in 1327. Lord Barclay, the owner of the castle and Edward's official gala, had a convenient alibi for the time of the murder, but it beggars belief to imagine that he did not know of the plot to kill the king. There has been a manor at Barclay since at least the late Anglo-Saxon times. Earl Godwin, father of Harold, the last Saxon king of England, owned Barclay Manor. There is an ornate silver chalice at the castle that is said to have belonged to Earl Godwin. The story goes that Godwin took communion from the cup every day. One day he forgot, and a storm promptly destroyed his lands in Kent. The present castle at Barclay was begun in 1153 as a shell keep. This fairly unusual design saw the stone keep surround a central mound rather than sit atop it in the normal style. A few generations later, in 1215, the castle was the final assembly place for the rebellious West Country barons on their way to their final confrontation with King John at Runnymede and the signing of the Magna Carta. Barclay Castle next made its appearance in the annals of English history when William Barclay, nicknamed William the Waysteel by a family historian, gave the entire estate of Barclay to King Henry VII in exchange for being made Earl Marshal of the realm. It seems that the Dukes of Norfolk, hereditary holders of the title, had fought against Henry at the Battle of Bosworth, and as a result, had the title revoked. William did not pass on his hard-bought prize to subsequent generations of Barclays, for he died without an heir, and the title reverted to the Norfolks. 
The castle was the property of the crown until the death of Edward VI when the entail was broken. Elizabeth I was much annoyed by this provision. She tried unsuccessfully to give Barclay to her favourite, the Earl of Leicester, but it was not hers to give. The bitterness between Elizabeth and the Barclay family came to a head when the Queen came to stay at the castle on one of her many progresses about the country. As she rode in the front gate with her entourage, Lord Barclay rode out, a supreme insult to the proud Queen and one she did not soon forget. The castle was besieged by Cromwell's army during the English Civil War and suffered a great deal of damage. The outer walls were flattened, the gatehouse destroyed, and the drawbridge demolished. The castle surrendered after three days of bombardment, so further damage was avoided. The interior of the castle is blissfully original. There is a 14th century great hall built just inside the castle wall. A lovely 16th century wooden screen graces one end of the hall. The room where Edward II met his fate can be viewed, but for those with a less gruesome turn of mind, the medieval kitchens and the morning room created from a Norman chapel are open to visitors. Another prize at the castle is the chest carried by Sir Francis Drake on his voyages on the Golden Hind. There are the requisite family portraits, including a Gainsborough and a Reynolds, and very simple and attractive terrace gardens. I really do hope that you have enjoyed this aerial presentation. Please subscribe to the channel so that we can keep you updated on other aerial videos shot in and around Northamptonshire and further afield. Subscribing is free and it really helps the channel to grow.